Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, divisions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Tonight on Apex Express, I'm your host, Miko Lee, and you are going to hear from a recent virtual reading and discussion that we just did this past week. You'll get to hear the lovely Alden Hayashi reading from his latest book, Two Nails, One Love. And this was a virtual reading that was done in collaboration with Kearney Street Workshop, with Tsuru for Solidarity, and with the National Japanese American Historical Society. So you'll hear um, an opening introduction and then Alden reading from his book and then an interview that I have with Alden. And it's a really fun and interesting conversation and follows up with a lot of the issues that we have been talking about on Apex Express, particularly with our series around the Japanese American incarceration after World War II. Alden tells a really personal story that's heartfelt and shares his experience. Two Nails, One Love is a semi-autobiographical novel about an estranged mother-son relationship that evolves and eventually heals as the son realizes just how much his life has been affected by his mother's traumatic past. The novel covers broad themes about discrimination, both racial and LGBTQ, about ethnic identity, and about immigration. So we think you'll really enjoy tonight's reading. We invite you to listen to tonight's episode. But first, we're going to hear a lovely musical introduction of Go Nakamura covering the cures just like heaven. You open up shining deep inside of me You soft and lonely You lost and lonely You just like heaven Oh, at least it 
doesn't matter what you do No, I never really get inside of you To make your eyes catch fire the way they should The way the blue can pull me in but they only knew At least I'd have some sense of sense And something else that hides away Me and you, the words apart With aching looks and breaking hearts All the prayers your hands can make I just take as much as you can throw And I throw it all away Yes, I throw it all away Like throwing faces at the stars Like throwing arms around yesterday I stood instead wide out in front of you The face I saw look back the way I just can't hide my tears the way you do Please, your best Thought that I could keep all of my promises I thought you were the girl I'd always dreamed about But I let the dream go Memory fade and the make-believe ran out Doesn't matter what you say, I just can't stay here every yesterday. Like keep on acting out the same the way we act out. Everywhere to smile, forget and make believe we never needed any more than this. Any more than this. Uh, covering the cures just like heaven. And now on to our reading. You're first going to hear from Jason Bayani from Kearney Street Workshop. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? Hope you're having a good night. Thank y'all for joining us tonight. We are uh, proud to be hosting Alden, Alden M. Hayashi's in celebration of Alden M. Hayashi, uh, celebration of Alden M. Hayashi's Two Nails, One Love, alongside our community partners, National Japanese American Historical Society and Suru for Solidarity. Before we kick things off, I'd like to acknowledge a few things. We'd like to make the following acknowledgments. We acknowledge that we're in a global pandemic that disproportionately affects the lives of the poor, the incarcerated, Black, Indigenous folks, and people of color. We want to recognize healthcare and essential workers for sustaining our livelihoods. We understand as we continue to deal with COVID that folks may be impacted in different ways. We wish you and your loved ones health and safety during this time, and thank you for spending tonight with us. This is a virtual event, but we would not be here nor have this technology without benefiting from colonization in the unceded Ohlone land that many of us live on today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So just to give you a rundown for the night, we'll be featuring a short reading with Alden and then a conversation between Alden and Apex Express's Miko Lee. And then we'll have a Q&A. But before we also start again, I'd like to bring up our community partners. First up, I'd like to bring up, I'd like to bring up Rosalind from National Japanese American Historical Society, who is selling the book tonight. So please get your copy of the book and definitely buy it through National Japanese American Historical Society. I'm the new collections manager at the National Japanese American Historical Society. Oh, we're located on Post Street in Japantown in San Francisco, and we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Throughout those 40 years, the society has been dedicated to the collection preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of historical information and cultural record of the Japanese American experience for not just ourselves and our community, but to engage with and show solidarity with all sorts of communities, both locally, nationally, and globally. And we strive through this work to be a catalyst for change through cross-cultural awareness and by learning from the past and seeking to influence the future with those experiences. And that's why it's so wonderful that we've been able to partner with Kearney Street Workshop and Aid and Elton Aiden here today for this really wonderful and poignant novel. It's a 
great part of what we do, being able to support ongoing cultural works within the Japanese American community. So we're very excited about that. We really want to thank Kearney Street Workshop for inviting us to co-sponsor. And we're so proud to um, be supporting this work. If you do wish to purchase a uh, copy of the book, you can do so through our website and we'll send it out to you directly, direct mail to your home or office. It'll be shipped to you in about two weeks. Or if you happen to be in San Francisco or the Bay Area, you can swing by our gallery on Post Street in Japantown and pick up the book there. Acknowledging that we are in the middle of the pandemic, so we do want to make sure that everyone's safe and they have the option of not having to come in and breathe the same air as us if they so wish. Um, there's some links in the chat and if you do wish to engage with us as things go on, we are going to have posted in the chat a video rundown of our current exhibit that's on in the Post Street Gallery, a retrospective of jam workshop posters celebrating the Oshavatsu New Year celebration here in San Francisco from uh, 1977 to 1999 and coming up we're going to be hosting 80th we're going to be marking the 80th anniversary of executive order 9066 and a bay uh, area day of remembrance program entitled known as free until we all are free on the 19th of February at 5 p.m. Pacific time. The event is free, but we do ask that you register for that. So if you do wish to join us at, for either of those exhibits or events, please do. And I'll turn the uh, session over to whomever is next. All right. Thank you, Lilith. I'd like to bring up Lisa from Super for Solidarity. Say a couple words. Hey, let me put the spotlight on you, Lisa. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for having us. Thanks for doing this event. Um, looking forward to getting my copy of the book, uh, hard copy of the book from the National Japanese American Historical Society. And looking forward to hear hearing Alden in discussion about this book. So my name is Lisa Doy. I'm one of the organizers with Sudu for Solidarity. Sudu was started in 2019 by a group of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated as children. And initially we were organizing against the Trump administration's use of immigrant detention facilities for families and the separation of families and children who were seeking asylum in the U.S. Over the past two years, we're nowhere close to celebrating a, a 30th or 40th anniversary yet, but over the past two years, we've tried to broaden our work in a few ways. We're still engaged um, in and trying to stop the ongoing practices of detaining and separating families in the immigration system, but we've also expanded more broadly into immigration in regards to policing, prisons, adult immigration detention, and just conversations about what are the practices that really will keep our community be safe. And we've also been expanding our work as well into supporting Black-led movements for reparations. And in all of this work, we try to draw connections between the past and the present to take a bigger look at systems of violence in the U.S. And one of the sort of motivating reasons for why we do this work around healing. And I think in the past several decades within the Japanese American community, there's been a greater discussion of and processing the intergenerational trauma of the Japanese American um, wartime incarceration. And this is in many ways really exciting to be part of a very ongoing process. And I also think it's important for me to think about the ways that not only is there intergenerational trauma, but there's also intergenerational healing and intergenerational resilience. And I think that's one of the things that I found sort of resonance between the work of Sudu and Alden's book. By no means I'm an expert, but I previously heard Alden in, in discussion about the book and how right, the process of writing, even though it's fictional, helped him think about his own relationship with his own mother. And I think to me, that's one of the ways where this process of intergenerational healing can continue even after those people, our loved ones, our families, previous generations may no longer be here. It's something that we still have the skills for within ourselves. So within Sudu, healing looks like a lot of things. One of the things we do is we have healing circles, which is a program and practice of intentional listening and sharing. But we also view our direct action work as healing itself. And it's something we're actually diving into in 2022 to think more deeply about how do we build a praxis of healing through direct action. And so I think both Two Nails, One Love and Sudu remind me of the sort of multidimensional, collective, personal, and timeless ways 
ways that healing can look different and shared to a range of people. If any of that sounds remotely interesting to you, please check us out um, at our website, which is sudoforsolidarity.org or on social media. And we're having an upcoming event on March 5th and March 12th. We're doing an abolitionist skills training. And it's really focused on the power of storytelling, direct action, and the arts. You do not need to have any previous experience with abolition. You don't even need to identify as an abolitionist. If you're just curious and learning more about what that might mean, or curious for a space where you can think about narrative and direct action and art making, please consider joining us on March 5th or 12th. And I will also hand it back to whoever is next. All right. Thank you so much. So yeah, let's get things kicked off then. All right. So it is my pleasure to bring up Alden M. Hayashi. Alden has been an editor and writer at Scientific American, the Harvard Business Review, and the MIT Sloan Management Review. After more than 30 years covering science, technology, and business, he has recently delved into writing fiction as a way to honor the memories of his grandparents' immigration to Hawaii, as well as preserve the stories of the lives of their many descendants. Two Nails, One Love is his first novel. Please, let's welcome up Alden M. Hayash. Thanks so much, Jason. And thank you to the Kearney Street Workshop, the National Japanese American Historical Society, and Sulu for, for Solidarity co-sponsoring this event. I, I really appreciate it. I'd like to read a, a short excerpt from my novel. And let me just give you a, a, a little context so that you might understand it a little better. My novel is essentially about the fractured relationship between a mother and son and how it eventually heals as the mother reveals more secrets about her traumatic childhood. The narrator is a a Sansei man in his uh, early 40s, Sansei being a third generation Japanese American, and his mother is in her uh, mid 60s. The son grew up in Hawaii, but now lives in New York City. The mother still lives in Hawaii and she's come out to visit him in New York City. The next morning, mom and I quickly decide this is the day we'll take the ferry over to the Statue of Liberty. After waiting in a long line, we're on the ferry, invigorated by the fresh air and spectacular view of Manhattan. Standing outside on the top deck, we watch as the ferry passes Governor's Island to the left and Ellis Island to the right. We soon see the Statue of Liberty clearly, just a short distance away. Mom and I stand silently as Lady Liberty slowly gets larger in our view, her outstretched arm lifting her torch, the beacon of liberty. Then, all of a sudden, Mom grabs my hand. I turn toward her and see tears beginning to well in her eyes. Soon, those tears are streaming down her face, which is now crumpled and overwrought with some powerful emotion. I'm more than startled. I'm shocked. I've never seen her so emotional in public. She didn't even cry at dad's funeral. Now here she is on a ferry crowded with strangers, sobbing uncontrollably. What's wrong? I ask in Japanese. Mom clutches my wrists even tighter, her short fingernails digging into my flesh as she tries to collect herself. After a few minutes, she finally tells me, I can't believe I'm seeing the Statue of Liberty again, but this time it's getting bigger and bigger. What? I have no idea what she's talking about. To my knowledge, she's never been to New York City before. So how could she have seen the Statue of Liberty in person? I begin to wonder if she's referring to some movie or TV show, or if maybe she's really confused from jet lag. Then mom starts rambling, half in English and half in Japanese. It's something about her parents, Aunt June, Buenos Aires, a Peruvian school teacher, India, the Philippines. Totally bewildered, I'm now frightened. Mom, slow down, I say as calmly as I can. What are you trying to tell me? Don't you understand, she pleads her eyes begging me to grasp something far beyond my ability. I never thought I would ever see the Statue of Liberty again. 
And here it is, getting bigger and bigger. I'm so confused. I have no idea how to respond. What words might bring some comfort to her rattled mind? But before she can explain anything, she suddenly realizes other passengers are staring at us, wondering what kind of drama is being played out between a mother and her son on such a beautiful autumn day. She closes her eyes as tightly as she can, takes a deep breath, and holds herself perfectly still. I can almost feel her summoning the strength from every fiber in her body as she fights to regain her composure. With her eyes still shut, she gradually releases her grasp on my wrist. She then reaches for a tissue from her purse to wipe the tears moistening her cheeks. Finally, when she opens her eyes, it's as if a switch has flipped and we watch silently as the ferry docks at Liberty Island. Later, back at my apartment, Mom settles on the living room sofa while I prepare some soothing tea. She stares out the window, looking so completely lost in her thoughts, her mind anywhere but in her son's cramped apartment on Manhattan. When the tea is done, I bring over a cup for her, and she quickly snaps back to the present. I I really don't know what got over me, she says, embarrassed and perplexed. You seem a lot better now, I tell her, but I'm worried. You were saying so many kinds of crazy things, things I didn't understand. Mom takes a healthy sip of the tea and looks directly at me, her brown, her large brown eyes heavy. I wasn't going crazy on the ferry, she says. I had seen the Statue of Liberty before, but I was only a young child then. This was during the height of the war, and when our ship put out of the harbor headed for Japan, I watched the Statue of Liberty as it became smaller and smaller. I really thought I was saying goodbye to America forever. And um, that's the end of the excerpt, and and that ends uh, part one of my novel, which uh, takes place in the present, and that then segues to part two of my novel, which gets into the past. And what happened to the narrator's mother is that she and her family had been shipped from Hawaii to a concentration camp in Arkansas. But more than that, during the war, she and her family were actually deported to Japan in a civilian exchange. And so they had to sail from New York Harbor to India, where they were then exchanged for Americans who had been stuck in Japan, China, and other parts of That was author Alden Hayashi reading from his latest book, Two Nails, One Love. You're tuned into Apex Express on 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley and online at kpfa.org. Next up, take a listen to Go Nakamura's Highway Flowers. On a winter day Finding true north Where the birds fly the opposite way A flock of birds Like a buckshot flying Perfect formation In the inkblot sky I'm by the freeway And I've come to ignore this Procession like a fleet leaving shore. Away flowers left by loved ones for someone to mourn with a cross and a heart shaped note and a photo. From the mountain on the shoulder confused Looking for something
thoughts keep returning so relentless and slow Like a metronome trying to show me the tempo And be the way that the pendulum swings And coming to go when you wonder the things I'm Keeping with me in the vault of my soul You're in my garden where you secretly grow Go Nakamura's Highway Flowers. And now I'm going to start with the question and answer period with author Alden Hayashi. Hi, Alden. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your reading with us. That was an incredibly powerful moment. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your journey. As Jason said, when he introduced you at the very beginning, you went from writing for Scientific Magazine and very nonfiction work to writing this tale that is of partially of your family. Can you speak a little bit about that journey that you took to sure. writing this novel? I'm trained as a journalist, and I've only done nonfiction writing. And I've worked at half a dozen different magazines, uh, always writing and editing nonfiction. I really wanted to tell my mother's story as nonfiction. And it's been in the back of my mind. It's a story that's been in me for the longest time. But the, the problem was that she didn't talk about the war. And I tried to get information from other relatives. And also I, I did a lot of, tried to do a lot of research through the National Archives, getting information about what happened to my grandfather, because uh, he, after Pearl Harbor was attacked in Hawaii, he, he was rounded up. He, he was one of the first people rounded up and sent to San Island on Honolulu in Honolulu, and then sent to a variety of camps on the mainland, ending up in Santa Fe. So he was separated from the rest of the family. I really wanted to do this as nonfiction, but there were so many gaps in my knowledge of what happened. Anyone who's done a lot of genealogical research or family research might appreciate this. I found that every time I got an answer to a question I had, that answer would almost always lead to more questions. And so I kept on thinking, geez, I get this answer, but then now I don't know about this. That raises this other question about this and that. And, and so there I was, Miko, you know, in my mid-50s and thinking, this could go on for quite a bit. I could be in my 80s and still doing research. And then the problem was that my relatives started passing on. And... Uh, making it even more difficult to, to get at the, the truth of what happened. So I finally, you know, made the decision that, and, and I had to publish this story in, in one form or the other. I, I couldn't let it die with my mother. Uh, she passed away in, in 2013. So it seemed to me that the, uh, I, I kind of got forced into writing fiction. It, it was only way I could see of doing the story so that there were parts of it that I didn't know I, I could use my imagination to fill in what people might have decided or, or their thought process in doing what they ended up doing. All that having been said though, the historical things that happened did happen. This civilian exchange did happen and my mother who was a, a U.S. citizen born and raised in Hawaii which was a territory of the U.S. at the time but she was you know, a, a citizen, she got deported to 
Japan in a civilian exchange. That happened. And most of the other things, historical things, not most, all, all of them did happen. So there was a kind of level of freedom that you had yes. as a writer to be able to take elements of your real family story, but then the gaps of knowledge, you could fill that in with historical references. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit? I know that you went, like many Japanese Americans do, on a pilgrimage to the concentration camp where your family was held in Jerome. And can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you and how that had an impact on your creating? That was a a powerful experience. And I've got to mention the the group, the Japanese American Memorial uh, Pilgrimages, which is run by Kimiko Mar. And and she she and her staff do a wonderful job of, of putting on these pilgrimages. Miko, it was so powerful. I, I thought I was prepared for it, but it really wasn't. Going to the site, seeing the, the railroad tracks, that were, was the tracks that my mother's train came on that came from the West Coast to, to bring she and her family to, to the camp. Actually seeing that land, and it, it, it was overwhelming at, at times, and, but it invigorated me, and, and it I was so motivated after because I, I was stuck with the writing and, and getting discouraged. Will I ever get this novel published? I was hell bent after that pilgrimage I, that I was going to finish this or I was going to die trying. I, I was going to finish it. So in, in that respect, you know, it was good. On the downside, and it, but maybe it was a good thing. I realized that I, I just, when an agent had seen my first draft, he had wanted me to tell my mother's story in the first person. To do parts of the, the novel, the, the narrator as a Nisei son in first person and the mother in first person, I realized after that trip that I couldn't do that, that I just, I, I was limited as a fiction writer. Like, I, I don't know how the air smelled when she first got to Arkansas. I don't know um, how the food tasted that she had. I, I don't know exactly how bored she might have been and how she filled her time. But it, I, it, it, I realized I couldn't do it in first person. So I wrote it as the mother telling her story to her son and the son relaying that to the reader. Because then, of course, the mother would be leaving out certain things. And you know that became part of the story. In other words, going on the pilgrimage helped me realize that I, yeah, my limitations in telling the story. We don't hear often enough about folks from Hawaii being incarcerated. And I'm wondering when you were a kid growing up in Honolulu, like when was the first time that you heard that your mom and her whole family were sent to the concentration camps? I was relatively young. I think I, I must have been in grade school, but maybe fifth, sixth grade or so. There was an exhibit on the camps in Honolulu and my parents went to it. And I remember the, the night they went. And she made it seem like no big deal, or they were into this exhibit. Or, and then they came back, and I, I think I might have asked her, what was that all about? And, and she said, oh, I was, when I was young, I, I, I was at a camp in Arkansas. And that's how she put it, camp. And I, what was I to think? I, I, I just said, oh, wow, you were at a camp, so you probably, you know, swam there, went hiking, and I... I had no concept of what she meant. And, and she, the way she said it, it was so offhanded that I didn't think anything of it. it. It wasn't until I was in high school, really, and I took a social studies class. My teacher, you know, Mrs. Miss Barbara Kokuda, I, I you know, still remember. And she taught about the Executive Order 9066 and, and the concentration camps and all this. And then I realized, oh, my gosh. <laughs> This is what my mother, it wasn't a, a camp or relocation center, or this was a concentration camp. It, there, were, there was barbed wire. There, there were guards in towers with guns. Yeah, so it was in high school. And I was like many uh, sansei, Nico, where we learned about it in high school, or sometimes in college. People finally, because our parents and grandparents never talked about it. Shout out to the good teachers out there doing the good work and bringing that history alive. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about the original story that you just shared, which is so deep about the Statue of Liberty, and share with our audience a little bit more about the truth part of that story. How much of that did you actually hear? How much of that was real and the story that you, uh, conversation that you had with your mom? Yeah, that 
Definitely, that really happened. This was in 1988 when, but the one big difference was in the novel, the narrator, Ethan's father dies when he's rather young, but my father lived until he was uh, 88. So it was actually uh, both my parents coming to visit me on the East Coast and we went to the Statue of Liberty and and I, I didn't think anything of it. My mother didn't make any big deal or whatnot. And so we were on the ferry headed for it and she really did have a, a emotional breakdown and she, she was overcome by emotion and it was scary. I, I'd never seen her like that. And my father was unnerved by it too. And the uh, <laughs> kind of funny thing, he's a typical Nisei man. He pushed me to my mother and help your mom, you know, sort of like, <laughs> and I was like, wait, that's your wife. Why don't you help her? Like, I don't know how to help her. I don't know why. You know, she's so upset and she, but pushed me to her. And yeah, so we ended up at, on Liberty Island. I think we caught the next ferry back. We didn't go in or do anything. And that night we we're in a hotel room. We had a suite. I, I could tell my mother did not want to be in public. So I, I told her, I said, okay, we'll just, I'll get Chinese food, take out food. I'll, I'll bring it back and we'll eat here. So we were eating and watching the Olympics. I, I distinctly remember this was 1988 and the Seoul Olympics were, were on at the time. Um, and I, I asked my mother, like, what, like, what happened? You know, and, and then she said, I, I was deported in the, and the boat left from New York City. And yeah, I, the last I saw the Statue of Liberty, I saw it getting smaller and it, I, I just, not, and here I was going to Japan. I'd never even been to Japan and I, I was being deported. And so that day when she actually saw the Statue of Liberty again, getting bigger and bigger, it was just um, overwhelming for her. And we talked a bit, but Miko, it, it was like, I had such a brief window where she was talking about the war. And then at a certain point, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes or so later, the, the window shut on me. And, and she just, she said, I, I, I don't want to talk anymore. Let's watch the Olympics. And I, I lost that opportunity. But she made it clear, you know, she, she was done talking about what had happened. I know your mom has passed since that time. And I'm wondering what question you would want to ask her if the window just happened to open again. What would you ask her? I, I have so many questions. <laughs> but I guess the, the one thing I... If she were alive, I'm pretty sure she would have read the book. And I would have asked her, did I get you right? I, I know there are parts of the book that are fictionalized. For example, in the book, she only has uh, one sister and one brother, whereas in real life, she had uh, nine siblings. But there are a, a lot of things like that change. But I would have asked her, did, did I get you the essence of, of you and what you went through? Did I get you, did I get it right? I, I, I hope I did. I think I did, but I don't know. And if she had told me that I didn't get her right, then I would have said, okay, then tell me, tell me your story so that I can get it right this time, you know? But this was my, the best I could do with the information I had and knowing you and knowing other relatives, your sister and, and knowing my grandparents a little bit, that, that was the best I could do. Um, you had mentioned to me when we talked that one of the stories that didn't make it into the book because of the complicated plot lines were your two uncles that mm. fought on different sides of the war. Can you just share a little bit about them? Maybe a prelude to book two. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, one of my uncles did get into the book, the, the, my mom's uh, brother, who did serve in the 100th Battalion, and he did do combat duty in Italy. But very fortunately, he survived. But in the book, he, he dies. But in real life, he, he survived. And he made it to his 100th birthday just last year or two years ago. Yeah. And uh, he, he since passed on, though. But the other brother, she had a, her eldest brother, uh, was Kibe. He was born in Hawaii, but he was sent back to Japan for to be educated there. He was in Japan when the war broke out because the, the war broke out so suddenly. Of course, there were, you know, warning signs of what was going to happen. But all of a sudden, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and then the U.S. declares war. Borders are closed. So that brother was stuck in Japan and he got drafted by the Japanese army and he ended up um, dying in combat in, in China. So, yeah, that part, and that's only 
two of her siblings, you know, she has uh, seven more. So to include all of that, you know, it, it just, it would become like a Russian novel. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not anywhere the writer to be able to handle that type of complexity. So I shrunk her family down to more manageable or what I could manage as a writer. And it turned out lovely. We got, it's so much depth and we really get that sense of the generations and the trauma and the impact that we have been talking about. I want to talk a little bit about the title. We, many people know the Japanese saying, the nail that sticks up must be hammered down. So can you talk about the title, Two Nails, One Love, and what that means to you. Yeah, I don't know when it came to me, Nico. It was when I was well into the writing process because also as a fiction writer, I I found that things come to me or I'm getting better at letting my subconscious kind of control my writing a little more. So as I was writing it, I think halfway through, I realized, oh, this is a story, a mother-son relationship and about how they're at odds with each other, but they don't realize how they are so similar. And it's their similarities sometimes that make them clash. As a lot of parents realize, or, or children with their parents, we children often realize at a certain point that, oh, I'm a lot more like my parents than I, I had Uh, thought I was or that I had intended to be. I I think parents realize much earlier that their children are wow, They have qualities that I I have and all. Yeah, I think the son doesn't realize how much of a nail his mother was, especially during the war. But that comes out as the mother starts to tell him uh, what happened during the war. And, And the mother doesn't like that part of her son that she sees herself in him, that he's this nail and that he's just going to, you know, do things his way and be independent and, 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 and go live his life, uh, you know, on his own terms. And which goes against the grain of a lot of Japanese culture where you try to fit in, uh, you don't cause waves. You, so, yeah, that's why it's uh, two nails um, and one love, the love between uh, parent and child. So for my last question, I'm going to credit to Sue for Solidarity and Lisa Doy and their amazing work, which is powerful around solidarity, around intergenerational trauma. And the question is, how do you, because the book is so focused on your family experience and a lot of trauma that was passed down, how did you prepare yourself to write the book? And how did you take care of yourself while you were on this journey? That's a, a, a great question. Uh, I I didn't prepare myself very well, <laughs> Miko. I, number one, I thought I was going to write it, you know, as nonfiction, and it started that way. And I thought I would be this objective observer as I write all or try to write all the nonfiction I write, like this non, uh, this objective, unbiased observer of action and kind of reporting what happened. But as soon as I started writing fiction, it, it became much more than that because it a lot of it involved me trying to put myself into people's heads and understand why they might have decided what they did, how they might have reacted to things that happened. And I wasn't prepared for that. I wasn't prepared. It it brought up a lot of strong emotions. And I, I wish I had done this when my mother was alive. I could have asked her a lot about it. And I think she would have appreciated that I, because I would have told her, I said, I thought I understood, and I think I understood on an intellectual level what you went through during the war. But when I actually started writing it and tried to like be you and, and be in your place and try to experience what you experienced, it, it was overwhelming. And I, I realized, and I, I would have told my mom this, that I realized I knew only the tip of the iceberg <laughs> But I didn't realize I probably knew only the tip of the tip and that the, what was below the surface was even larger than I could have imagined. Yeah, so I didn't prepare well for it. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have any advice in that respect. I'm, I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> and it was painful at times, but I'm so glad I did it because I think I appreciate now, or at least I think I do appreciate now more of what, what Nisei's and the Issei generation to experience a, a little more. I, I, I hope I'm a little below the surface now, or maybe I'm still at the tip of the iceberg, but, but I'm lower, you know, I'm, I'm getting there, you know. 
discovery and exploration. Yeah. That's where you're at. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to move to some of the questions that have come in mm-hmm. from the audience. And one is about why your family in particular was sent to Arkansas. Why were they sent to that camp? And why was your mom's family sent back to Japan? A lot of people don't know. That, a lot of people uh, mistakenly think that the, the forced evacuation and incarceration of Nikkei, a people of uh, Japanese ancestry during World War II, was a West Coast thing. But no, there were a lot of people, Nikkei, from Hawaii who were affected. There were, you know, at least 2,000. And it was mainly, initially, it was mainly the heads of, of communities. So it was Buddhist priests, it was Japanese language teachers, it was editors of Japanese newspapers. It was all kind of the community leaders. My mother's father was a wealthy businessman in Honolulu. That part is uh, pretty accurate in the book. That is real life. So yeah, he was rounded up and uh, he was sent to forget about half a dozen different camps, army camps at first on the mainland and then eventually ended up in Santa Fe. And my mother's family was then sent to Arkansas, Jerome Relocation Center there. Oh, I'm sorry, Miko, I forgot that. The other question was, why were they sent back for Japan for the oh, exchange, okay. the hostage exchange? Yeah, they the war broke out so suddenly that there were so many Americans who were caught behind enemy lines. They were stuck in Japan or Hong Kong or Shanghai or other parts of uh, Asia that were controlled by Japan at the time. The U.S. wanted them back through diplomatic intermediaries. I think Spain played a role in in kind of brokering this deal, this exchange of civilians. Um, There were two exchanges. The first one, I believe, was on the and it was a great thing. It was a very humanitarian thing because there were also Japanese nationals who were stuck in the U.S. Not only diplomats here, but Japanese businessmen or that wanted to be repatriated to Japan. So the first ship, I believe, was the people who very willingly wanted to return to their home countries. The problem was the second ship, and this is the one my mother's family got roped into being on, there were far more Americans who were stuck in Asia because they were also missionaries and their families in China, Singapore, Philippines. There were a lot more of Americans than there were Japanese nationals. Somewhere along the line, the U.S. government, you know, realized, oh, we'll throw in some Japanese Americans to up the body count. And as horrible as that sounds, there's also a, a Subchapter to this, which I, I know, Nico, where Japanese and in Latin America were also, they were essentially kidnapped, brought to the U.S. so that the U.S. would have these bodies that it could change to get back Americans who are stuck in Asia. For those that don't know, check that out. Sudo for Solidarity does a lot of work around Mm -hmm. that. 3,200 Japanese Latin Americans were kidnapped from their homes in Peru and in other countries and then brought over to the U.S. against their will. And then not given apology or reparations until multiple lawsuits later. One more question from the audience, which is from Elaine Koyama. And it is, how did you decide what parts to fictionalize and what parts were true to your past? Uh, trying to think the hardest part about writing this I think was editing it down to to something that was manageable Uh, especially because this is the first time I'm writing uh, I was writing fiction and like I said I'm I'm, I'm not a Russian novelist I, I couldn't handle the complexity of my mother's family instead of her being there being 10 siblings you know, I, I shrunk it down to just uh, three. My mother, the, the, the mother character in the book has only a sister and brother. I also shrunk down my own story because I have three brothers, but I need Ethan, the narrator, and only child. I thought it was just easier to uh, handle that, especially for me and in, in, in my uh, limited writing. So, yeah, it was mainly ed- editing down the pieces of... Um, I, I, I liken it to uh, chess. I, I'm a chess player, and I'm actually a lot better chess player when there are fewer pieces on the board. I, I can see things better, and I, I can think more steps ahead. I, I'm not one of those chess players that you know are brilliant and can play with with all the pieces and can think six steps ahead. 
So uh, I'm like very much like that as a writer, especially of fiction. It's like the, the fewer pieces I have to work with, I, I feel the, the less I can screw up the story. And I can just get to the bare essence of the story, which I, I hope I did in the book. I think I did without getting sidetracked with a, a lot of ancillary stories. You wrote a separate short story that was about identifying as both an Asian American writer, Japanese American writer, and also as a gay man. Mm -hmm. And what was the, and where you find in this place in time, how you identify Mm -hmm. yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Part of me is a a little embarrassed to admit that in in my 20s, uh, as I was coming out as a gay man, I'm not shunned the, the Japanese American community, but I just, I, I didn't have time for that. <laughs> uh, and, and I think I hurt my father because my, my father was very active in Hawaii. He at one point was uh, president of the Hiroshima Kenjin Kai. And I think he would have loved for me to be involved uh, as, or be involved with his church, Shinto church in, in our neighborhood. I just, I wasn't interested, Miko. And I, I identified primarily as a gay man who happened to be Japanese-American. And I I think a lot of it, when I look back at it now, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I I think part of it was because this was during the worst of the AIDS epidemic, and and the vitriol against gay men was just horrible. And I felt so threatened as a gay man, and I think that's why that was my community. And I have to say, as a gay man, I felt very accepted by the gay community. And my being Asian or Japanese American was not, not a factor. Whereas at the time, I, I felt not as welcome as a gay man in the Japanese American society community. Here's my very last question for you. And this comes from Robin Takayama. And for those of you that have been following the chat, Robin's been dropping a lot of knowledge into the chat. So you can click those three buttons right by the chat and save that down so that you can have a chance to look at all those links later. So in D.C., at the memorial to Japanese folks that were incarcerated during World War II um, and to the Japanese Americans who served in 442, this is a question from Sudo for Solidarity. So there is a quote from Senator Inoue, who's from Hawaii, who was from Hawaii. The lessons learned must serve as a grave reminder of what we must not allow to happen again to any group. So why did you choose to include this quote and what relevance does it have today? Uh, Yeah, I think it has a lot of relevance. And I have to say that I I wrote a lot of the book during the Trump administration. And actually, people laugh when I say this, Nico, but there's some truth to it. I I almost felt like I should should have put Donald Trump in the acknowledgments. Because of him, I was even also more hell-bent on finishing this book. (laughs) Because because of his policies, you know, starting from day one with the anti-Muslim travel ban. And I think if you look throughout human history, there's always been scapegoats, unfortunately. I I, I guess it's uh, human nature that when things don't go the way we want or there's catastrophes or or whatever, it's so natural to find a group you can blame things on. And, and almost always going to be a minority group, you know, ethnic or religious, who are more vulnerable. And so I just, yeah, I just think that this is going to be history that will be repeated. I, I had a journalism teacher, Nico. He told me something once I'll never forget. He said, throughout history, the verbs, adjectives, adverbs, they all stay the same. It's just the nouns and the names that change. And I feel like that with during World War II, it was Japanese Americans, and now it's Muslim Americans. In 10 years, it might be somebody, what group? It, history repeats itself. And, and so, yeah, that quote, I think, is. Then, Hayashi, thank you so much for chatting oh, with us you. and for sharing about your book, uh, Two Nails, One Love. Thank you so much for listening to our reading of the book, Two Nails, One Love by Alden Hayashi. If you're interested in purchasing the book, you can actually go to the National Japanese American Historical Society and type in the code loyal member and receive a 10% discount. And we'll put the link to that in our website. Um, they're also hosting a very cool New Year's poster retrospective that you can check out online. 
And they will be hosting a Bay Area Day of Remembrance with virtual program. That's going to happen on February 19th at 5 p.m. Um, that's called No One is Free Until We Are All Free. And it's recognizing the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. To find out more about Suru for Solidarity, you can also check out our website. They are offering, as Lisa Doy talked about, an amazing abolitionist skills training program, March 5th and 12th. And that is on abolitionist tools and storytelling and how we can reach shared liberation. Um, we'll also put a link to Alden Hayashi's website so you can find out more. And the great work that's going on at Kearney Street Workshop. Kearney Street Workshop is going to their 50th anniversary. So we are so happy to be able to work with all of these amazing collaborators. Thank you so much for joining us. Please check out our website, kpfa.org, to find out more about We Are the Leaders and the guests we spoke to and how you can take direct action. Apex Express is a proud member of ACRE, Asian Americans for Civil Rights and Equality. Find out more at our website, acre.org. We thank all of you listeners out there. Keep resisting, keep organizing, keep creating and sharing your visions with the world. Your voices are important. Apex Express is produced by Preeti Mangala Shakar, Tracy Nguyen, Miko Lee, Jelena Keenly, and Jessica Antonio. Tonight's show was produced by your hosts, Miko Lee and Jelena Keenly. Thanks to KPFA staff for their support and have a great night. Midnight sky, black is so beautiful it makes you cry. These are the words of the last poets from their prolific poem, Black Is. In this spirit, we invite you to join KPFA for a very special day of programming celebrating Black History Month. On Monday, February 21st, the anniversary of Malcolm X's assassination, programmers come together to present Black Is, 360 degrees of the black experience. Listen at 94.1 FM or online at kpfa.org. You can email blackhistoryspecial at gmail.com for more information. Join us on February 21st, 2022, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for Black Is. Toni Morrison was born in Ohio in 1931. She was an African-American novelist who became the first African-American woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature. She is celebrated for her novels written about African-Americans from a Black perspective, what she called the Black gaze. Ms. Morrison showed how devastating and destructive racism can be through its efforts on the characters in her books. The beauty of her prose and depth of her understanding can provide deep insight for those willing to see. This has been a profile in Black Excellence for Black History Month. 
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org.